Did everyone but my mother and me assume that who my dad was was public knowledge? It wasn't quite that bad. I looked at her. She said reluctantly, it was maybe worse during the voodoo wars, but by then everyone knew you and your mom had married Charlie and Charlie's family had lived in Old Town forever and you were normal by context, you know? And then you had two dead normal little pests for brothers. Nobody ever, ever caught you doing anything weird at school. You seemed just as fascinated as the rest of us when some of the ngoos and blood axes and so on talked about magic handling. I don't deny that a few people looked at you a little sideways. I'd let my tea sit too long, but the bitterness in my mouth seemed appropriate. You were into cooking, Ray. And a generation or two ago, the blazes were top dog, sure. Were they, I thought. So many things my mother never told me, although I couldn't really blame her for my avoiding reading Globenet articles that mentioned the blazes, could I? I'd wanted to be Ray Seddon. You still heard a little about them at the beginning of the wars, but then it's like what was left of them disappeared, so maybe you were genuinely normal, you know? Most people say the magic handling runs out in families sooner or later. The SOFs didn't think so, I muttered, disappeared. Bo's lot brought me a blaze, and not just the third cousin who can do card tricks and maybe write a ward sign that almost works, but Onyx Blaze's daughter. Onyx Blaze, whose mother taught his daughter to transmute. How did the people who were looking at me sideways count those one or two generations? What else could my grand do, had she done? Disappeared how? And nobody gets more normal than your mom. True. I would think about how to thank her for my very well-embedded normalcy later. It might be difficult to choose between cyanide and garroting. Can we go outside, I said. The sun was behind a cloud, but daylight is still better than indoors. Emil, I want to ask you a favor. Done. Okay, thanks. It's what SOF wants me to do. Try and get some location fix on one of your creepy cosmos. But I want to do it somewhere that isn't behind proof glass. In daylight, said Emil. Okay. We'll do it at my house. My next afternoon off is Thursday. I'll find someone to swap with. It's not only the proof glass, is it? It's also SOF. You don't want to do it just because SOF tells you to. I nodded. I know they're the good guys and everything, but... I know. Once I found out they were watching me, I changed the way I do some stuff. They are good guys, and I do work for them, and I don't mind much. But it's all a little nomad for me, and I still have this silly idea that my life belongs to me. There were good reasons Emil and I were friends. I went home that night and stood on the balcony again and said to the darkness, Con, Constantine, are you all right? If you need me, call me to you. For a moment I felt something, like a twitch against your line when you're half asleep or thinking about something else. It may be a fish and it may be the current, but it may be a fish. I'd learned the fish because Mel taught me, not because I longed to impale small invertebrates on barbed hooks and repel out of piscine oral cavities and smother felon oxygen breeder breathers in an alien medium. The flicker itself made me think I was half asleep or thinking about something else because I was straining after any sign whatsoever, and it was gone again at once. Thursday afternoon wasn't flash ideal, but I managed. Polly was a little too not sorry to change his single weekly 4.30 in the morning shift for another afternoon that Thursday, and he hadn't made up the one he'd missed our last 13-day week yet either. I'd worried about just how not sorry he was. I'd worry about just how not sorry he was later. Meanwhile, I got up at 3 a.m. to do a little extra baking, like I had a point to make. As I drank the necessary pint mug of blacker than the pit of dim tea to get me going, I stood on the balcony again, testing for quivers in the current. All I got was a stronger sense that there was something wrong. But I was good at feeling there was something wrong, even when there wasn't, something I'd inherited from my mother. And there was nothing in this case but my own blangy unease to look at. There are advantages to driving an old wreck instead of a modern car. Wrecks bounce around and jerk at your hands on the wheel and help keep you awake. The charms in the glove compartment were more restless than usual, too. I think they were objecting to the driving. 
By the time I got off work at noon, I felt it had been several years since I'd had any sleep, and I had a nap instead of lunch. I bought sandwiches in a bag, and Emil had a, put, a pot of tea waiting for me. It was another gray day, but Emil had pulled the comm box table around so that the chair backed up against the window, which she had opened. What daylight there was fell on me as I sat there, and there was a little wind that stroked my hair. Where do you want to start, said Emil, with the bingo one from the other day, or do you want to start fresh? I hadn't thought about it. Good beginning. It was so hard to screw myself to do anything. The details got a bit lost. Who or what was I looking for, Con or Bo? Since I was doing it alone with Emil, I wasn't trying to make Pat and Jesse happy. So what was going to make me happy? Define happy. But if I found something on the other side of the real globe that Pat and Jesse would get all tangled up in negotiations with their local SOF equivalents over, it might get them out of my hair. Finding Bo wasn't going to make me happy, but I didn't want to look for Con with anyone else around, even Emil, which left Bo or the unknown. The unknown at the moment was unknown. Bo, on the other hand, was after me. Bo, then. Let's start with Bingo. Emil brought up the file, highlighted the Cosmel I wanted, and stepped back. I squinted at the screen. I could see the winking bar of highlighting, and the button was under my finger. I pressed. It was like hands around my throat, a crushing, splintering weight on my breast. There was also a horrible, horrible pressure against my eyes, my poor, dark, dazzled eyes. I was lost in the dark. I no longer knew which way was up and which down. I was vertiginous. I was going to be sick. No. I steadied myself. I found an alignment somewhere, somewhere reaching in the dark. I was... No, I wasn't standing. There didn't seem to be anything to stand on, and I wasn't sure there was any of me to stand with. If my feet had disappeared, then perhaps it wasn't surprising that my eyes, no, my sight had disappeared too. This wasn't just, just darkness. This was what came after. This was the beyond dark, and I could only see in the dark. My eyes were still there, or perhaps they were now my non-eyes. I couldn't see with them, and blinking no longer seemed relevant. But the pressure was there, and why was it so difficult to breathe, especially since at the same time breathing seemed as irrelevant as blinking? Why did I want to breathe? Where was I? I was stretched along some intangible line, a compass needle. Compass needles don't mind the dark, although I doubted I was pointing toward anything like a north that I'd recognized back in the real world. Maybe I'd found where Emil's Cosmo had come from, but where was here? And was there some clue I could take back with me to the world I knew, if I could get back there? I experimented with moving. Moving didn't seem to be an option. I was too much like nothing here in this non-place in the beyond dark. Right, okay. Next time I come, I'll organize my question better going in. Next time, presupposing I get out of this time alive. I was grateful for the pressure against my eyes, the difficulty breathing. It made me feel I still existed somehow, somewhere. I was a magic gambler, a stuff changer, ablaze by blood and lately by practice. Not much practice, but growing all the time. I remembered another sense of alignment when I had changed my little knife to a key. I reached for that sense. Now I reached for my knife. It shouldn't have been there, and I had no fingers to feel for it. But I was suddenly aware of it. I couldn't see it, but I knew that it was a light even in this darkness. And by its invisible light, I could see, see, feel, hear, smell, live. I heard a rustle, like leaves in a breeze. And for a moment I stood on four slender furred legs, and I could feel and hear and smell as no human could. And then I was back again, sitting in Emile's living room, and her hand was reaching through my powerless fingers and pressing the button. The screen went dark. That was not good, she said.
the death she escaped, if she knew what her death was for, if that could have made any difference, if that was why she... I touched the knife bulge in my pocket. It felt no different than it ever had. We sat in daylight. If I took it out, it would look like any other pocket knife. The second blade, which I rarely used, would be covered with pocket lens. The first blade, which I used all the time, would need sharpening. Folded up, it was about the length of my middle finger, and a little wider and deeper. It was scraped and gouged by years in a series of pockets, sharing cramped quarters of things like loose change and car keys. And it glowed in the dark, even in the beyond dark of the void, glowed like a beacon that said, hold on, I've got you here. I felt carefully after my experience of nowhere of beyond dark. Had I brought anything back after all, anything I could use? Yes, but I didn't know what it was. It wasn't anything so straightforward as a direction. Not caffeine after that, said Emil, still on the floor. Scotch. She got up on all fours and reached to the little cabinet next to her. The answer is no. I looked at her when she gave me a small, heavy glass with a finger's width of dark amber liquid in it, about the color of the thin wooden plates set into the sides of my little knife. We won't try it again today, I said, but we have to try again. No, we don't, she said. Let SOF figure it out. It's what they're for. If they could figure it out, they wouldn't be asking us. The wars are over, she said. Not exactly, I said after a pause. Didn't Pat tell you? Yes, he told me we'll all be under the dark in a hundred years, she said angrily. I know. I slid down to join her on the floor. I felt like a collection of old creaking hinges. I leaned over and put an arm around her. I don't want to know either. After a moment, she said, there have been two more dry guys in Old Town this last week. Have you heard about them? Yes, it had been on the news a few days ago. Great stuff to hear when you're driving alone in the dark. And Charlie and Liz had been talking about it when I brought the first tray of cinnamon rolls out front. They had fallen a silent. I pretended I hadn't heard anything and toppled the first burning hot roll onto a plate for Mrs. Bialski. She patted my hand and said, don't you worry, sweetie, it's not your fault. Because she was Mrs. Bialski, I almost believed her, but I made the mistake of looking up into her face when I smiled at her and saw the expression in her eyes. Oh, I almost patted her hand back and told her it wasn't her fault either, but it wouldn't have done any good. I guess I wasn't surprised to find out that Mrs. Bialski wasn't only about litter and rats and flower beds. I wouldn't have joined SOF just because Pat can turn blue, Emil said. Working in a proof glass room gives me asthma, even part-time, or maybe it's just all the guys in khaki. I went back to Charlie's for the dinner shift, but Charlie took one look at me and said, I'll find someone to cover for you. Go home. I'll go when you find someone, I said, and lasted two hours, by which time poor Polly had agreed to give up the rest of his night off after being there all afternoon. Teach him to be glad to escape the 4.30 in the morning shift. I was home by 8.30. It was just full dark. Charlie had sent me home with a bottle of champagne that had a glass and a half left in it. Perfect. I stood on my balcony and drank it and looked into the darkness. The darkness danced. I had had an idea. I didn't like it much, but I had to try it. I went back indoors and unplugged my comm box. It's never quite dark under the sky, and I didn't have curtains for the balcony windows. I tucked the box under my arm, ducked into my closet, and closed the door. This was real darkness. There wasn't a lot of room in there, but I swept a few shoes aside and sat down. Turned the box on, listened to the resentful hum of the battery. It was an old box and preferred to run off a wire. The screen came up and asked me if I wanted to enter the globe net. I sat there staring at the glowing lettering. In the darkness, it didn't flicker at all. It didn't run away into millions of tiny, skittish, dwindling dimensions, like looking into a mirror with another one over your shoulder. I read it easily. I liked it even less than my idea had worked. At least I didn't have to use a comm box at Charlie's. It would have been difficult to explain why I needed a closet. I brought the box back out of the closet and plugged it in on my desk. Not that I invited people home very often, but I was touchy about looking normal, even to myself, now that I was behaving more like Onyx Blaze's daughter. Your comm box on a desk is much more normal than your comm box in a closet. 
Could my dad see in the dark? Could any of my dad's family? I couldn't remember any of them except my gran. The rest were tall, blurry shapes from my earliest childhood. Emil was right. The blazes had disappeared during the wars, but I hadn't noticed. I had been busy being my mother's daughter. Even if I wanted to contact them, I had no idea how. I could ask Pat or Jesse. Right after I told them I had a brand new hotline to Vampire World, the new horror theme park, it would blow the ghoul attack simulation at the other museum clean out of the water. It would make the dragon roller coaster ride at Monster World look like a merry-go-round, just as soon as we get a few little details worked out, like how you get there, and then how, and, and how you get away again. Meanwhile, I still hadn't told them that I could stay, see in the dark. Would I have told them a few days ago if Emil hadn't been there? It was what I'd gone in to tell them. I went back to the balcony. I felt for an alignment. I stood at the edge of the void, but I stood in my world, on my ordinary feet, looking at ordinary darkness, with my not-quite-ordinary eyes. Constantine, Con, are you there? This time I was sure I felt that tug on the line streaming in the dark ether, a coherent pinprick of something in the incoherent nothing, but I lost it again. I was so tired I was having to prop myself against the railing to stay standing up, so I went indoors and went to bed. Meanwhile, on other fronts I was adapting, I usually hit it right the first time when I reached for the spoon, or the flour sack, or the oven control. I hadn't walked into a door in several days. After the vision had risen like a tide and floated me off my grounding in Old Roy Park, after I'd seen what I'd seen in Maud's face, whether it was there or not, since I could hardly ask her, when the vision subsided and left me standing on solid earth again, some of the dizziness had subsided too. It was as if the dark was a kind of road map I'd been folding up wrong, and this time I'd got it right and it would lie flat at last, although road maps didn't generally keep unfolding themselves and flapping at you saying, here, here, pay attention, you blanker. I thought it as a road map of sorts, but it was about a country I didn't know, labeled in a language I didn't understand, and it didn't unfold so much as erupt. I didn't know if I'd seen what I'd seen in Mrs. Bialski's face either, the morning she told me not to worry. So which did I like better, that my affinity was growing stronger, that it could pull me out of the human world into some dark alien space, or that I was merely going mad and slash or had an inoperable brain tumor after all? Did I have a third choice? I worked pretty well straight through that day and got home in time to have a cup of tea in the garden. Yolandi's niece and her daughters had left after a two-week visit, and it was none of my business, but I was secretly delighted to have our garden to ourselves again. Yolandi came out and joined me. I watched a few late roses do a kind of waltz with their shadows as a mild evening breeze played with them. Then I watched Yolandi. I'd always liked watching her. I wished she could bottle that self-possession so I could have some. It was a little like Mills, I thought, only without the tattoos. I was feeling tired and mellow and was enjoying this so much it took me a while to realize something strange. The shadows lay quietly across Yolandi's face. I snapped out of being mellow and stared at her. She saw me looking and smiled. I jerked my eyes away hastily. What? How? Why? What could I ask her? Nothing. I looked at her again. The shadows on her face were quiet, but they went down a long way, like looking into the sky. What did I know about her? She had inherited this house from some distant relative who had also been childless and felt the spinsters of the world needed to stick together. She'd moved here from Cold Harbor when she retired. I didn't recall she'd ever told me what she retired from. She had that calm, strong centeredness I thought of as ex-teacher, ex-clergy, ex-healer sister or midwife. I couldn't imagine her as someone in a power suit navigating a desk with a combox screen the size of a tennis court and a swarm of hot young assistants in an outer office whose haircuts were specially designed to look chic wearing globe net headsets 10 hours a day. I couldn't ask. If she'd wanted to tell me, it would have come up long ago. It probably had nothing to do with what she'd done for a living anyway. It was probably like having freckles or curly hair or transmuting ability. You're born with it. 
But things like transmuting ability tend to lead to other choices. I don't think you've ever told me what you retired from, I blurted out. I was a wards keeper, she said easily, as if she was commenting on the pleasantness of the evening, as if my question wasn't entirely rude. Wards keeper. I wanted to laugh. No wonder her house, go her house wards were so good. You didn't earn that title easily. There were hundreds of licensed ward crafters, first, second, and third class for every wards keeper. The rank of wards keeper granted an unrestricted authority to design and create any protection against any others that any client wished to hire you for. Even wards keepers had specialities, large business, small business, home, personal bodyguard, and the whole murky business of watchering, which ranged from honest protective surveillance to downright spying. But you didn't get your wards keeper insignia unless you could make a more than competent stab at all of it. Wards keeper, she must then, her own house, but con. I realized I'd said the first word aloud, I hoped only the first word, because she was answering me. Now, I'm not your idea of a wards keeper, am I, she said. I was never anyone's idea. But once I was established, new business came to me by word of mouth, and my prior clients usually had the good sense to warn future clients that they were going to meet a drab little old lady. I have been old and drab since my teens, by the way, which gave the impression of being hardly able to cross the road by herself. Who gave the impression of being hardly able to cross the road by herself? She looked at me smiling. I admit that crossing the road alone has never been one of my greater gifts. Cars move much too quickly to suit me and frequently from unexpected directions. I was always a much better maker of wards. I couldn't think how to ask my next question. I couldn't even summon up the spare attention to who to the idea of Yolandi being drab. But then she went on, almost as if she was reading my mind. People often are not what one might expect them to be. I would not expect a young, likable, sensible, and sun-worshipping human woman who works in her family's restaurant to have a friend who is a vampire. Then I could say nothing at all. My dear Yolandi said, I have now told you almost as much as I know about your private affairs. Yes, there are more wards about this house and garden than you are aware of, and the fact that you haven't... been aware of them is perhaps an indication to me that I have not yet lost my skill. I knew, of course, that a vampire had been visiting, but I also knew that you had not merely invited him in, but that you were under no coercion to do so. A good ward, my dear, will also prevent a forced invitation from achieving its object. And my wards are good ones. It took no great effort of intellect to puzzle out some of what happened to you during the two days you were missing last spring, especially not with the reek of vampire on you. Sherlock Holmes, do young people still read him, I wonder, made the famous statement that once you have eliminated the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. This is a very useful precept for a maker of words, and I am not, perhaps, wholly retired. Vampires, as vampires will, caused you harm, but in this case, very unusually, not terminal harm. This one particular vampire, therefore, can be assumed to have done you some service, and that service created some sort of, some kind of bond between you. This wild theory, suggestive of someone further into her dotage than she wishes to believe, has been lately fortified when he returned, not once, but twice. I know that your unlikely friend is a vampire, a male vampire, and that there is only the one of him whom you invite to cross your threshold. This I have found very reassuring, by the way. Had there been more than one, I think my determination to assume the best rather than the worst might have failed. Although I admit I have doubled the wards around my own part of the house, I have nothing to indicate that he is my friend, too, you understand. And the human revulsion toward vampires generally is well justified. Yolande leaned forward to look into my face. In the roundabout way of an old lady who perhaps spends too much of her time alone, I am offering you my support in this impossibly difficult task you have taken on. The natural antipathy between vampires and humans means, I feel, that it is some task. I doubt either you or your friend is enjoying the situation. 
I don't suppose your new SOF colleagues know about either the task or the friend, do they? I managed to shake my head. I am not surprised. I doubt SOF is very adaptable. Lack of adaptability is the root cause of much trouble in large organizations. I thought of Pat turning blue and smiled a little, but only a little. She was right about their attitude toward vampires. She was right about the universal human attitude toward vampires. I had not planned to say anything to you. I had at first assumed that whatever happened four months ago was over, but the vampire taint on you remained. That wound in your breast was some vampire's handiwork, wasn't it? So much for the camouflage provided by high neck shirts. I nodded. And then your friend came, and now there is no wound. The two events are related, are they not? I nodded again. That is as good a definition of friendship as I need, but I will no longer call it a taint. The fleck, the fingerprint of the vampire is still upon you. I'm afraid the metaphor that occurs to me is of the eater of arsenic. If you eat a very, very little of it, over time you can develop a limited immunity to it. I do not know why you should choose to immunize yourself like this, or why he should. My dear, forgive me if I have been a hopeless busybody, but your inevitable and wholly justified dismay, confusion, and preoccupation of four months ago has changed, certainly, but it has not decreased. It has increased alarmingly so. She paused as if she hoped for an answer, but I could say nothing. My dear, there is something else my words have told you, that your nickname is more than an affectionate joke. I can believe no evil of someone who draws her strength from the light of day. If I can help you, I will. The sense of a burden unexpectedly lifted was so profound it made me dizzy, not least that by its lifting I realized how heavy it was. I had assumed I had known that there was no one I would be able to tell about my unlikely friend. There was certainly no one I would have risked telling, and now Yolandi had told me. There were two of us who knew. Maybe that meant the task was not impossible after all, whatever the task was. Well, wiping Bo out would be a service to all humankind, certainly, whether Khan and I survived or not. But offhand, I couldn't see how even having a wards keeper on our side was going to be useful. Besides, I had a selfish desire to stay alive myself, bag the future of humanity. And Khan was failing to show up to help me make plans. He was the one who had told me that time was short. The new dry guys in Old Town bore something of the same message. But there was now another human who knew about Khan and me and hadn't freaked out. I felt better even if I shouldn't have. Thank you, I said. Don't thank me yet, said Yolandi. I haven't done anything yet except pry into your private affairs. I would not have done so if I had felt I could not if I had felt I could risk not inquiring into them. Well thank the gods and the angels for nosy landladies, this nosy landlady. Is there such a thing as a an anti ward, something that attracts, I said. Yolandi raised her eyebrows. My unlikely friend, he should have come back and he hasn't, and I don't know how to find him. And the binding between you, I shook my head, it isn't strong enough, or, or it's like it crosses worlds, and I can't enter the vampire world. Or I can, I thought, but I don't know what to do when I get there, like how to find anything, like how to get out again. Then perhaps he has not called you. Interesting that she should know he had to. I think he is in trouble. I think he may be in enough trouble that he can't call me, or he doesn't know how. Vampires don't call humans, do they? One eyebrow stayed up as she thought about this. I see the difficulty. She sat silent for several minutes, and I sat in that silence, half remembering a thing called peace. I'd forgotten peace in the last four months. It said something about my state of mind that merely sharing the fact of Khan's existence with someone else with a heartbeat made me remember it, in spite of the hard, dreadful knowledge of the existence of Bo. She stood up and went inside. I gave myself another cup of tea and looked at the roses. Feeling at peace, however fragilely, made it easy to slip into the visionary end of the dark side. The rose shadows said that they loved the sun, but that they also loved the dark, where their roots grew for the lightless mystery of the earth. The roses said, you do not have to choose. My tree said yes. 
My doe stood at the edge of the forest shadows, looking into the sunlight, her back sun dappled. You do not have to choose. I didn't believe it. Hey, how many hamburger eaters on the planet are haunted by cows? When Yolandi reappeared, her hands were full. I can make something more connected for you, more like a, a loop and a rope, but here is something you can try straight away. Two candles and a little twist of strong smelling herbs. Put the candles on either side of you and the herbs before and behind you. Light them as well. Do you have smudge bowls? Wait a few minutes till the smoke from all mingles and seek your friend. I waited till full night dark and then I settled on the floor inside the open balcony door. I lit the candles and the herbs and stubbed the herbs out again. I waited for the smoke to mingle. It wasn't exactly a pleasant smell, but it was interesting and intense. A drawing sort of smell. It drew me into it. I closed my eyes. Calm down you. Where are you? I'm sure you're in trouble. Call me to come to you, you stubborn bastard. I was back in the vampire space, but the smoke had come with me. It wrapped round and round me like an enormously long scarf. Streaming behind me into the human world, streaming before me into the vampire beyond dark. I lay suspended in between, but this time I felt neither lost nor sick. Sunshine, pay attention. I felt neither lost nor sick. It wasn't the same space. It was some other weird, other void where no human had any business. The big difference was that this one wasn't trying to kill me, at least not at once. Was this the back way? The little country laneway after the speed and roar of the superhighway had been too much for me earlier. I still couldn't read the map. Pity you couldn't just take a bus. I wriggled a little where I lay. There was still the uncanny pressure of alien space, the difficulty breathing, the blindness, the awkwardness, as if a human body was the wrong vehicle if you wanted to travel here but it lacked the malevolence of the nowhere I'd been in that afternoon in Emile's living room, and the smoke scarf gave me a little protection, as if against a bitter wind. If I were a car, then I'd rolled my windows up. Okay, here I was. I practiced breathing. A little time went by, if time went by here, till the strangeness, this non-malevolent strangeness, began to feel like merely the medium I had to work with. I was a painter who had been handed a dripping glob of clay, a singer who had been handed a clarinet, a baker of bread and cookies who had been handed a vampire. I bent and turned, seeking the alignment I wanted. There, now, almost, there. And then I heard his voice, sunshine, once, only once, my name, there. The shock of when I hit the exact bearing felt like putting my whole body in an electric socket. Wow. But then I was blazing along that line like an arrow from a burning bow. The smoke was stripped away by the speed of my going. My hair seemed to be peeling off my scalp, and the pressure was increasing and increasing. I was being stretched, rolled like a ball of dough between palms to make breadsticks, a fluff of sheep's wool twisted and squeezed to wind round a spindle, Thinner and thinner and thinner, a bit of blood bread crushed between huge fingers, poked painfully through the eye of a needle. Wham. I dropped out of the darkness, the void, the utter space, back into something like somewhere, back into my body if I had been out of it. I fell a little distance, smack, onto something, something red or chilly and slightly yielding, but not very, and also curiously lumpy. I would have slid right off it again. Except that it wrapped its arms around me, rolled me over so that it was on top of me, pinning me securely with its weight, and buried its fangs in my neck. I froze. Well, what are you going to do? And all this was happening, flick, 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 like the frames of a movie, too fast to react to. It was dark, black dark, as dark as the void I had so recently traveled, and while I could see in the dark, I didn't have much practice in this kind of darkness. And also, well, there was this other stuff going on, you know. My chief awareness was centered on the feeling of teeth against my neck. The teeth hadn't broken the skin. His teeth hadn't. 
His hair was in my face. I'd had his hair in my face once before, but he'd been bleeding on me that time. Maybe it was my chance to return the favor. He had said he wouldn't turn me, that he couldn't turn me. He'd also said that I could be killed like any other human. Standard deaths of humans included being dry guyed. Maybe vampires didn't like drop-in visitors. Well, I'd tried to call ahead. Ha ha. His teeth were still against my neck. Other than that, he was motionless. I mean that, motionless. Like being lain on by a stone. A stone of things, of course. His hair smelled musty, damp. It wasn't an unpleasant smell. If it reminded me of anything, it reminded me of spring water, wet earth, and moss on the rocks around it. But it wasn't his usual vampire smell. Don't ask me how. I knew it was him, but I did. Besides the fact that I guess if it had been any other vampire, he wouldn't have hesitated midway for the thing burying action. He was cold, motionless and cold, cold all the way down the length of him. There seemed to be a lot of skin contact going on here. I blinked against the dark. I shivered against his body. I felt then briefly his lips against my neck as they closed over the teeth. His face rested against the curve of my neck a moment, two moments. Two of my heartbeats. He was growing less cold. I was used, sort of, to the lack of a heartbeat. But I was pretty sure he wasn't breathing either. What vampires call breathing. The fizziness I'd put my arms around when I'd discovered my car was gone that day at the lake, that wasn't there either. He raised his head, another of my heartbeats and another. He shifted his arms so he was no longer holding me like a garage clamp holds a recalcitrant engine. I turned my head fractionally. I could see the gray gleam of his cheek and jaw in the blackness. My dark vision was adjusting. I felt my eyes trying to see, like when the eye doctor gives you one of those funny lenses to look through and everything is all wrong. It was disconcerting to see and what I knew was darkness, like burial. No, not a good metaphor. But wherever we were, it felt underground, and I didn't think that was just the darkness. He raised his head a little further and turned his head to look at me. And I saw the stagnant pool color of his eyes change to bright emerald green again. I remembered that the first time I'd seen his eyes, the night at the lake, they had been stagnant pool colored. How had I not remembered that transformation? Probably because I hadn't seen it happen. That had been back in the days when I believed myself to be fully human and when I couldn't look into a vampire's eyes. He was also getting warmer. He was now no colder, say, than a hibernating lizard. This was still a little chilly from where I was, though. I felt his chest expand, and his first breath drifted across my face. I remembered being carried back from the lake, leaning against that chest, recognizing breathing, not recognizing any rhythm to it. He'd taken his weight onto his elbows so I could breathe more easily. I remember thinking on the long walk in from the lake that I wouldn't have been able to match my breathing to his, but he was matching his breathing to mine now. I also abruptly realized that I was feeling his dick growing long and hard against my leg. We were both naked. I knew that vampire body temperature is at least somewhat under voluntary control, like circulation of the blood is. It is perhaps a bit variable, especially perhaps under stress. He'd gone from dead cold, you should pardon the expression, to what you might call normal human body heat in about a minute. I'd known, I'd been pretty sure he was in trouble, that's why I was here. Perhaps I'd roused him too suddenly. Perhaps he was in what passes in vampire biological science for shock, and his control systems weren't responding. That didn't explain the dick, though. It was responding. He was now suddenly hot, as hot as if he'd been in a kitchen baking cinnamon rolls in August. I already knew vampires could sweat under certain conditions, like being chained to a wall of a house with sunlight coming in through the windows. He was sweating again now. Some of his sweat fell on me. I've always rather liked sweat. On other occasions when I've had a naked sweating male body up against mine, I've tended to feel that it meant he was getting into what was going on. This usually produces a... 
similar enthusiasm in me. Not that there was anything going on exactly yet. Remember how fast and suddenly this was all happening. And if he was in shock, so was I. Maybe my brain hadn't fully come with me in that zap through the void, like my clothes manifestly hadn't. With a truly masterful erection now pressed against me, I turned my head again and licked his sweating shoulder. What happened next probably lasted about ten seconds, maybe less. I don't think I heard the sound he made. I think I only felt it. He moved his hands again to tip my face toward him and kissed me. I can't say I noticed any things. I had the lingering vestige of sense not to try anything clever with my teeth, which I hoped I was going to, to have the opportunity to, to tell Yolandi that she didn't have to make anything special, that the herbs and candles would work fine if you wanted to call this fine. I remembered with an effort that when I arrived, so to speak, Khan had been cold and not breathing. But for all I knew, this is merely the human, <laughs> the vampire equivalent of a nap. <laughs> Lots of humans are cranky when they're woken unexpectedly. <laughs> no, I didn't think his eyes would go stagnant, <laughs> stagnant pond colored for a nap. <laughs> okay, <laughs> maybe I had accomplished my mission, <laughs> that he'd been in some kind of vampire trouble and I'd got him out of it. I should have been embarrassed. I should have been paralyzed with embarrassment. <laughs> I was sitting, no, I was crooked up, naked on a cold stone floor in the dark, having been cannoned off the wall by a well, a creature, that I had been under the impression I was about to have an intimate encounter with. <laughs> Maybe I should try to be grateful at having been spared intimacy with the most dangerous of the others. Gave a whole new meaning to the phrase, under the dark. I wasn't grateful. You want to talk cranky. Coitus interruptus takes me well beyond cranky. My engorged labia felt like they were pressing on my brain, what there was of my brain. And if I didn't get to fuck someone, something now, a vampire would do, I was going to fucking explode. My cunt ached like a bruise. Beyond cranky, rather fortunately, it doesn't transmute into embarrassment. It transmutes into fury. As my blood pressure began to rearrange itself to a more standard, unengorged pattern, I was seething. I couldn't care less that I was also naked and alone in the dark if I had no idea where. Well, I couldn't care much. Not very much, really. It was a large room, empty except for me. And the ceiling was so high, even my dark-sighted eyes couldn't make it out. No furniture, no windows, no nothing. Funny sort of place for a nap, or maybe for a solitary siege. But then I wasn't a vampire. <clears throat> it was at least as dark as the inside of my closet, so nothing flickered when I looked at it. What there was to look at. Wow, what a bonus. I would try to control my euphoria. He reappeared. He was wearing what I was beginning to think of as his standard get-up of long, loose black shirt and black trousers. No shoes. I couldn't be sure, but I didn't think I'd ever seen him in shoes. He was carrying something else, which he came close enough to hand over without looking at me. 
I unfolded it and discovered another long, loose black shirt. When I had pulled it over my head, it came nearly to my knees. God's bloody damn it all. I was not in a good mood. He was still not looking at me. I was still seething. I beg your pardon most profoundly, he said. Yeah, I said, nice to see you too. He made one of those quick vampire gestures, too rapid for human eyes. My no longer quite human eyes could about follow it. At any rate, they registered frustration. Good, that made two of us. Although on second thought, or maybe semi-thought, I doubted he was indicating physical frustration. Uncomfortably, I began to be glad of the long black shirt, which probably made me look like deaf, especially in this light, or this no light. Black is not my color, any way you hang it. But then looking like death might be very attractive to a vampire, in which case there was even less to explain why. My anger was subsiding. I didn't want it to subside. I needed the warmth. But he'd thrown me away, hadn't he? Whatever his dick said, he didn't want me. Anger was much better than misery. Misery approached. I wrapped my arms around myself and shivered. Maybe he saw the shiver. After your... He paused. You need food, he said. I can't even feed you. He glanced down at himself as if perhaps he was expecting a peanut butter sandwich to be suspended about his person. If he was contemplating opening a vein and offering it to me, the answer was no. If he was contemplating it, he rejected the notion. I wondered what he meant by can't even feed me. I must also thank you for retrieving me, he said. Finally, he looked at me. Retrieving, Shiva wept. Any time, I said, I'm sure I'll enjoy reviewing my assortment of new scars and recalling how I got them too. The ones from being slammed on my back and landed on like a sack of boulders and the ones a few seconds later from being thrown across the room into a wall. I saw him flinch, one for the human. Sunshine, he said. He made a move toward me and I flinched away, one for the vampire. I didn't mean to say it. I didn't mean to say anything about it. I was determined not to say anything about it. My voice came out high and strange and sticky with wretchedness. Why? I know about having to invite one of your kind. For about six months when you're 13 or 14, it's every teenage girl's favorite story. Because it's about finding out that you have power. Maybe I got the details wrong, like you need it engraved RSVP. I suppose you prefer the black border to the narrow gold line. Delivered to your door at least 48 hours before the moment. Maybe you need it printed in blood on, on vellum. And silly me, I couldn't find your door to deliver it. My voice was getting higher and higher and squeakier and squeakier. I shut up. <clears throat> he stood there with his hands loose at his side, staring at the floor. His hair flopped down over his forehead. I wanted to brush it back so I could see his eyes. I wanted to do nothing of the kind. I would bite my own hand off before I voluntarily touched him again. I believe you were inviting more than you knew, he said at last. I sighed. Oh, good. Cryptic vampire utterances, my fave. Now you're going to say something opaque and oracular about the bond between us, aren't you? But it got me here, but let's not get carried away, maybe. He moved so quickly, I would not have stepped aside in time, but he stopped himself short and did not touch me. But he didn't stop very short. As it was, he was standing so near it was hard not to touch him. I put my hands behind my back like a dieter offered a choice of bitter chocolate death or meringue mania. I do not disturb you by choice, he said. Can you not believe that? He made another of those vampire noises. It went something like, er. Perhaps you cannot. This, our situation, is not made easier by thousands of years of my kind disturbing your kind. Disturb is one word for it, I suppose, I said nastily. <laughs> I was still in a bad mood, still unhappy and wanting to cause unhappiness in return, and still half blasted out of my skull by events since I had found out that evening that my landlady knew I was jiving with a vampire. A lot had happened in a short space of time, not just one particular thing out of a morbidly kinky soap opera. I too am disturbed, he said quietly. <laughs> I had my mouth open for my next uncharitable remark and changed my mind. I moved away from him, found the wall, and leaned back against it. I didn't want to sit on the floor and have him looming over me, and there wasn't anything else to lean on. 
Except him, of course, and that wasn't an option right now. Disturbance, okay. If I could stop feeling mortally wounded in the ego for a moment, I might begin to remember again what was going on here. He was a vampire, I was a human. We weren't supposed to have any bonds between us, except straightforward generic ones, of murderous antagonism and so on. And, speaking of kinky soap opera, no one ever had an affair with a vampire, not even in blood lore, which was always getting prosecuted for one thing or another. The reason why, when you were 13 or 14, you outgrew your fascination with the idea that a vampire couldn't do you unless you let him, is that you began to take in the fact that shortly after you'd said, come and get me, big boy, you died. It was illegal to write stories and make movies about sex between vampires and humans. It was, in fact, one of the few mandates the Global Council really agreed on. The stories and movies got written and made anyway, but if the government caught you at it, they threw your ass in jail for a long time. Okay, he probably was disturbed, too. I looked at him, wondering if he was wondering how he'd wound up here, wherever here was. About why we'd been able to create this antithetical bond and what exactly it consisted of. It probably was a good idea not to make it any more complicated and intense than we had to. A small part of me whispered, oh rats. Another small part whispered, yeah, well how come he's the one who managed to remember? Suddenly I was exhausted. Truce, I said, still leaning against the wall. Truce, he said. I was only going to shut my eyes for a moment. I woke up feeling rather comfortable. I was laying on something soft, but not too soft, and wrapped in something warm and furry, and there was a smell of apples. My stomach roared. I opened my eyes. No, I didn't open my eyes. I only thought I had. I was having the most ridiculous dream of my life thus far, and I'd had some pretty ridiculous dreams in my day, something out of Gormenghast or the Castle of Otranto or House of Tombs. I wanted to say to my imagination, oh, come on. <clears throat> but my stomach was still roaring. I often eat in my dreams. I know you're not supposed to. And the apples were sitting beside me with a loaf of bread and a fantastic goblet, hilariously in keeping with the general flamboyance of my immediate surroundings. So I sat up and reached for the nearest apple and saw the silky black sleeve falling back from my arm. I didn't hiss as well as he had the night he discovered the wound in my breast, but I gave it a good shot. I was so used to my eyesight behaving strangely that the flitteriness of the lighting hadn't at first registered, but it did now, both that there was light and that it wiggled. There was some heat source behind me. I turned around. The fireplace, of course, was huge. It was shaped like some monster's roaring mouth. You could see the monster's eyes. Well, two of them. I chose not to look for more. Gleaming above the mantelpiece of its writhing lips. You might not think writhing lips would have any flat spots, but there were candelabra ba balanced up there, shaped like snakes' bodies and dismembered human arms. Each eye was bigger than my head and gleamed red, although that may have been the firelight. No, it wasn't the firelight. Khan, cross-legged on the floor, straight-backed, shirtless, barefoot, his head a little bowed, looked redder as he had the first time I saw him, only not so bony. He was also less gray, washed in the ruddy firelight, and my heart beat faster when I looked at him for different reasons than it had that first time. He looked up as I turned, our eyes met. I looked away first. I picked up the apple and bit into it. So maybe he lived near an orchid. How, how long had I been asleep? That didn't explain the bread. I wasn't going to ask. I wasn't going to ask about the bottle of wine on the floor next to the little table either. The table was a depressed-looking maiden and a very tight swath of material with no visible means of support, holding the carrying surface at an implausible angle between her neck and one shoulder. Even more implausible was the angle of her breast, which I don't think even cosmetic surgery could achieve, which was a straightforward local Chardonnay. I'd have preferred a, sip, a cup of tea. A glass or two of this on top of everything else that had been happening, and I'd be off my chump. But hey, I was already off my chump, I mean. I poured some wine gingerly into the goblet. Pity to waste it. He'd already drawn the cork. Ever the polite host. The wine seemed to go a long way down before it hit bottom, like dropping pebbles in a well. 